Today, Dr. Thomas. My name is Michael and I'm today's host. Dr. Thomas is a board certified family medicine physician practicing direct primary care for Plum Health in Detroit, Michigan. Direct primary care is a form of health care focused on streamlining visiting your primary care physician and allows you to have a direct relationship with your doctor and minimize costs. Dr. Thomas's services is the first of its kind in Detroit and Wayne County in Michigan. And uh, before we begin, I have also a couple of reminders before um, we start. We encourage you to turn on your cameras if you're able to. This session will be recorded and uploaded to our YouTube channel, and there will be a QA at the end for any questions we have. Uh, you can type in the chat anytime or on mute at that time during the QA. But with that said, that's all. Uh, Dr. Thomas, feel free to take it away. Okay. Um, let's see. I uh, yeah, so my name is Dr. Paul Thomas. I didn't know that. Uh, I thought this was more going to be more of a Q&A here. Uh, I didn't realize that you guys wanted me to just uh, grip it and rip it here. So um, let's see if I can pull this up. Um, I've got a little presentation I can give if that works for everybody. I think it will just kind of uh, give a nice frame for the conversation. And I can... Uh, pull that up now. Just give me a few minutes. If you can allow me to share my screen for you guys, that, that'd that be great. You should have permission. Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, just going to take a second to load here. Um, yeah, so my name is Dr. Paul Thomas. I'm a family physician. Um, I practice in Detroit, and I started this uh, direct primary care practice that allows me to spend more time with my patients. And that's really the bottom line. Um, you know, I have a philosophy that, you know, we all went into medicine to help people and to take care of folks and lift them up, meet people where they're at and um, help them to heal. And I found that I wasn't really able to do that in the fee for service system, uh, meaning our current uh, insurance-based system just because I didn't have enough time to really spend with folks and to really, you know, meet them where they're at and, and listen to them. You know, it, I'd like you guys to interact here. So I have a question for you. How many patients do you think the average family physician has in their practice? Any takers on that? Four hundred. Somebody wrote four hundred, and that's a pretty good guess. That would seem like a reasonable amount of people. You know, I went to high school with uh, four hundred people in my class, in my graduating class, and I didn't really know everybody. Um, I knew just about everybody, but not everybody. Somebody else had a thousand. That's another reasonable guess. You know, maybe you go to a church, a pretty big church, and there's a thousand members in your church, and maybe you know like most of the families there, but maybe not every single individual. Um, any other takers? Somebody said 100. Somebody said 200. Okay. You have a lot of idealistic folks in this chat, and I love it. Yeah, it would be reasonable to take care of 100 or 200 or 300 or 400 or 1,000 patients. That'd be a reasonable number of people to take care of. Um, if you consider that you have to see 1% of your panel each day. So if you had a thousand patients, maybe you see 10 patients a day, um, but that's just not the case. You know, the typical family medicine doctor has 2,400 patients in their panel. So they have to see about 24 patients a day, realistically somewhere between 20 and 30 patients each clinic day. Now, if you see 24 patients in a clinic day and you work eight hours, how, many, how much time do you have per patient? maybe about 20 minutes. Yeah. Peter nailed it. Thanks, Peter. You're really on your toes today. So 20 minutes per patient. Now, what's really crappy about that is if you have 20 minutes to see your patient and you have to speak with them and take their history and perform a review of systems and perform a physical exam and come up with an assessment and plan, that's great. You could probably do that in 20 minutes but then you have to document all of it into a clunky electronic medical record system. And it's not intuitive and it takes time. It takes, doctors typically spend more than half of their time documenting the patient encounter and less than half their time per visit with the patient. 
So let's say you spend eight minutes with your patient and it leaves you 12 minutes to document the encounter in the electronic medical record. And so I really wanted to get away from that system. So my PowerPoint is loaded here. So I'll share my screen. Let me know if you guys can see this. We'll uh, start from the beginning. Uh, slideshow, play from start. Okay, great. So my name is Dr. Paul Thomas. I'm a family medicine doctor in Detroit. Behind me is the Michigan Central Station, an important landmark in our city that's being redeveloped right now. now I'm here today because I believe that healthcare should be affordable and accessible for everyone. And that's radical because it isn't. Uh, healthcare isn't affordable and accessible for most people in our country. And I think we need to change that. Um, I've spoken about what I've what I do, the work that I do, what I believe in at TED Talks. Uh, I've also written two books about it. One's called Direct Primary Care, The Cure for a Broken Healthcare System. And the other one's called Startup DPC, How to Start and Grow Your Direct Primary Care Practice. Um, I was named Entrepreneur of the Year in 2018. And then I was invited to the White House by Health and Human Services Secretary Alex Azar to talk about my ideas around direct primary care and lowering the cost of care for people in the United States, you know, specifically with my insights from Detroit. I've been invited on some local talk programs and um, I've also uh, been able to transform, you know, this little space in Southwest Detroit into a functioning medical office uh, where I can see patients confidentially, really interact with people on a personalized basis. And then as we grew and became more successful, I realized that we needed a bigger spot to practice. So I started working uh, with some grants in our neighborhood, uh, specifically the Motor City Match. I'm here with the mayor of Detroit, Mayor Mike Duggan. Um, I, I pitched at Quicken Loans Demo Day. We won some grant money there. We were able to parlay that success into building a larger office, again, with uh, myself, my practice partner, my wife, my brother, our medical assistant, Mayor Duggan, uh, some support folks from the Detroit Economic Growth Corporation, et cetera, to, to build out a bigger office to serve more people in our community. I was able to hire two doctors along the way to help me do it, Dr. Raquel Orlick and Dr. Leslie Rabot. And we happily serve uh, over a thousand patients in, in our Detroit office. We're right around 1,100 patients. And so, you know, that's a bit about me. Uh, let's get to the crux of the matter. These are the problems in healthcare right now. I'm, I'm gonna lay out some issues that I see that we need to fix in, in primary care. Uh, number one, 54% of doctors say they're burned out. Um, and if that comes as a surprise to you, it shouldn't. There's, there's a lot of factors that are burning out doctors. You got a pack schedule, you've got less and less time with your patients. You have more and more time with the computer and electronic medical system. You have um, declining reimbursement. And then on top of that, there's inflationary forces that make that reimbursement less and less valuable, right? So uh, your payments are fixed by Medicare and Medicaid, and then your payments are fixed through insurance systems. And so you can't really, you're kind of stuck. You can only see more patients to make more money. And at, at some point you realize your time is a finite resource. Um, so 54% of doctors say they're burned out. Um, and this is a question I pose to people. If half of the light bulbs in your house went out right now, uh, what would you do? Uh, someone said panic. <laughs> Yeah, panic would be a good one. Buy more. I, I would say you might call an electrician because there's something seriously wrong with the wiring system in your house. And, and I, I make that analogy because I think there's a serious problem in our current healthcare system with the delivery of, of medical care, where it leaves half of our caregivers, half of our doctors burned out. And, um, you know, a lot of hospitals and clinics and residency programs and medical schools say, oh, do yoga, uh, take a wellness day, meditate, go to this retreat. But I think those are band-aids on a much larger problem. And it's a system where we, in which we work, where we're seeing more and more patients in less and less time. Uh, so 
does anybody know the average wait time it takes to get a primary care appointment um, in the United States? You're calling a doctor's office. You're saying, I want to have a primary care visit with a doctor. How long does it take to get in? How many days? Somebody says two to three weeks, two weeks, couple of days, 10 days, two weeks. That's, that's probably pretty close to the truth. It's 24 days on average across the United States. It's 24 days here in Detroit. The longest wait time is 109 days in Boston. Um, and so the idea is that there aren't enough family physicians to see people on a, on a convenient basis because doctors are so overwhelmed with 2,400 existing patients. And then everybody knows that that experience is like you. Make the appointment, you wait three weeks and three days, you get to the office, you wait for an hour to see the doctor for 10 minutes, and then it's on to the next one um, for the physician. I talked about this already, but you know, 2000 doctors have 2,400 patients in their primary care practices, and it doesn't leave them enough time to take care of all of the uh, refills, all of the screening tests. So there's evidence of the, the routine health maintenance, the med refills, the diagnostic work is missed. Half of the diagnostic work is missed because doctors are simply overwhelmed and they don't have enough time to fully dedicate to those patients who come into those time slots. Um, and I think that's really poor, poor care. Then on top of that, doctors have so many documentation requirements that there's something that's called uh, pajama notes. So doctors will literally go into the office, work an eight to 10 hour day, and then come home, make dinner, put the kids to bed, read a story, pour themselves a glass of wine or crack a beer, and then do 86 minutes of clinical documentation after hours, 86 minutes. So it's an hour and 26 minutes of additional care time on the EMR. And so some people joke that like, oh, I don't take care of patients anymore. I take care of an insurance company or I take care of the electronic medical record. That's the, that's the real burnout. You're, you're not, you're just like pushing paper. You're not really taking care of patients anymore. And a lot of doctors feel that way. And it's a really terrible place to be. Um, and so as a clinician, as a doctor, it feels like, you know, catching sand. When you have 2,400 patients, you're seeing 25 patients a day. You only have 10 minutes with each person and 10 minutes to document in the chart. Um, it feels like you're missing things. Like it could be somebody's strep throat. It could be, uh, you know, your, your dad's Alzheimer's diagnosis. It could be your sister's breast cancer diagnosis. It could be a friend's um, you know, mismanaged fracture, you know, doctors just don't have enough time to fully invest in everything they need to, and things are falling through the cracks. So uh, direct primary care is an alternative practice model that I employ. You know, obviously I'm biased and I love direct primary care, but um, I'm going to walk through what it is. It's a really simple concept. I deliver my primary care services directly to my patients, and then they pay me for those services. Usually doctors have to bill an insurance company to get paid. In my system, I don't. My patients just pay me directly and I deliver the healthcare services they need. Now this is a growing movement. It's a relatively new movement. Uh, when I started my practice five years ago in 2016, there are about 300 doctors practicing in this model. So this is a map of all the DPC practices. You can see it you know, in Michigan over here, uh, this movement has grown over time. And now there's about 1500 direct primary care practices across the country, Alaska, Hawaii, Puerto Rico, pretty much every state in the union, uh, except for maybe North Dakota. Um, I threw this in, you know, to anybody's from Ohio, just, you can see that most of these are centered around um, urban areas like, or suburban areas. So Cincinnati, Columbus, Cleveland, but you're getting some like more or less rural areas of, let's say, uh, rural Indiana, um, uh, rural Ohio, et cetera. So the point I'm trying to make is that, you know, direct primary care can be successful in any sort of environment. All right, let's see. So uh, routine medical care for a monthly fee. So 
like I said, direct primary care is a simple concept. People pay a membership to be a part of the service. They pay me directly. And in this case, it's a monthly membership. Most direct primary care practices charge between 50 and hundred dollars. Some charge less than 50, um, some charge hundred to 135, some charge a little bit more. I say, if you're charging over $200 a month, it gets into the realm of concierge medicine. Um, but I digress. So, you know, $50 a month or hundred dollars a month, that's less than a cable bill. Um, that's less than a cell phone bill. And it's, uh, in my opinion, it's affordable for anybody with an income. And so I say, if you can afford a cell phone for yourself, you can afford a direct primary care membership. If you can afford a cable bill for your household, you can afford a direct primary care membership for your family. And so um, this should bring up our price points here. Let's see. Oh, um, direct primary care practices must charge a periodic fee, not bill on a fee for service base, basis and not charge a per visit fee that exceeds the periodic fee. So um, I don't know if you know this, but when you go to see a doctor, even if you have insurance, they'll charge you a copay, sometimes like 30 or 50, or sometimes even $80, depending if it's a specialist or whatnot. In our practice, we don't have copays. Uh, if you pay the membership, you can call, text, or email anytime and come into the office for an appointment at any time. So it's radically different. And we guarantee a same day or next day appointment for our members. So we really wanna provide our patients with a ton of value. So we have fewer patients. You know, Right now I have about 450 patients. Um, rather than seeing 2,400 patients and doing an okay job, I wanna see 415, 450 patients and doing an, do an amazing job where every interaction my patient feels like they're getting a ton of value out of my service. Is that radical? Is that cool? You guys like that? Um, that's, that's kind of what we try to do in our practice. Um, on the patient side, you know, patients often walk into like a mess of middlemen and bureaucrats between them and their doctor. First of all, they got to pay an insurance company just to see a doctor. And then there's people like pharmacy benefit managers that inflate the cost of meds. And then sometimes you have to go to the hospital for imaging and the costs are really inflated at the hospital. Same with lab work, costs on labs can be really inflated. Um, and so there's all these middlemen between patients and their doctor. With the direct primary care model, we remove all those barriers, we remove all those middlemen, and we deliver care directly to our patients. And then we coordinate additional services like meds, labs, imaging, and specialist consults. At the cross, crux of this is like, okay, we're there for our patients. We're available by text, phone call, email, in-person appointments, same day or next day, guarantee. I respond to my text messages within 24 hours. I respond to my emails within 24 hours. I really listen to my patients and try to hear what they're trying to tell me and, and try to meet them where they're at and guide them to the next step in care. Um, to make this real, uh, you know, if, if you, if you let's, let's do like healthcare economics 101 in terms of billing insurance, let's say you go into the hospital and you, or go to the clinic, your doctor, and you have pneumonia bronchitis that is going to be billed out to the insurance company at $130. Now the insurance isn't going to pay the, the clinic that full amount. Okay. Shocker. You went to med school for four years. You did residency for three years, and now you're billing an insurance company to get paid for the work that you did. And rather than give you the full amount, the full value that you're worth, they're going to pay you maybe like 60% of that and say, no, it's not worth $130. It's worth 80 bucks. Here's 80 bucks, kid, go away. And so you're like, okay, I guess I don't have any recourse because there's no other way to get paid. And so I'll take the 80 bucks. Now, unfortunately, you have to employ a biller, a coder, a medical assistant, a nurse, a receptionist, maybe a physician assistant or a nurse practitioner to help you manage this huge volume of patients and to make sure that you get paid by the insurance company. Because if you send out a claim to the insurance company and they reject it and they say, oh, we're going to pay you zero dollars, you have to file a, like a, you know, another claim and just say, no, I, I'm worth $130. That's the work that I did for my patient. 
but you don't necessarily have an hour every day to do that because your time is really valuable. So then you hire a biller or a coder to do that work for you. And so it inflates the cost of care. Um, and so your clinic overhead is about 60%. For every dollar that you bring in, 60% goes out in overhead. And so, um, you know, unfortunately I, I did like a generous thing where I put the overhead in this example at 50%. So you're left with $40 per visit. So every time you see a patient, you make $40. Doesn't matter if you spend 10 minutes with them or 50 minutes with them or an hour with them. If you bill insurance, that work is worth 40 bucks. So what doctors do is, you know, if you're in primary care, you want to make $200,000 a year, or let's say generously, you want to make $250,000 a year. So how do I get to, and, and then I'm going to work 50 weeks a year, five days a week, that's 250 working days a year. So I want to make $1,000 a day, right? So I'm going to see 25 patients each day to make, you know, $1,000 a day, that's $40 per patient. And then, you know, for 50 weeks, five days a week, that's $250,000 in a year. That's the math. That's how you make money. But along with that comes, you know, probably less than ideal for care for your patients, a lot of emotional fatigue, a lot of burnout. And, you know, quite frankly, doctors are like not super happy with the way they practice because there's all these regulations and administrative burdens on them when they're just trying to deliver good care to their, their patients. I'm not saying doctors in the fee-for-service system are bad or um, it's just a really bad system and it puts people in really bad situations. It puts patients in bad situations, puts doctors in bad situations. So with direct primary care, we eliminate all this, you know, let's say garbage in the middle that inflates the cost of care and, and makes us have bad relationships with our patients. And we deliver care directly to our patients and they pay us directly this 50 to hundred bucks a month. In our practice, we charge kids $10 a month. We charge adults $49 a month, and then it goes up from there based on age. And so typically we're making on average, maybe like 50 to $60 per member per month. Uh, okay. So if you're making like, let's say $60 per member per month, and you have 500 members, you're making $30,000 a year. Now your overhead in the direct primary care practice is lower. So let's say 33%. So you're left with, you know, $10,000 to cover your overhead expenses. That's your rent, your printer, your malpractice insurance, your meds, your labs, et cetera, a medical assistant. Um, and then you're left with the remainder, which is about $20,000 a month. So you can, you know, essentially see five to 10 patients a day because you have 500 patients. You'll see 1% of your panel each day and make roughly $240,000 a year. That's where this, this is like the contrast between fee-for-service and direct primary care. So um, you ultimately in direct primary care, you're, you're responsible for your patients and their care and their needs. And so as a doctor, you're seeing the patient directly and then you're coordinating meds, imaging services, labs. So I'll open up the uh, question here I have for you. How much do you think it costs to run a comprehensive metabolic panel at a typical hospital? Comprehensive metabolic panel, if you don't know, is like a chem seven plus some other things. So you get a blood sugar, uh, sodium, potassium, chloride, uh, AST, ALT, liver function tests like that. You get uh, protein, albumin, alkaline phosphatase, um, among other things, BUN, creatinine, GFR, that's all in your comprehensive metabolic panel. How much do you think that costs at a hospital to run all those tests? Oh, we got somebody in the chat. We got a couple of people in the chat. Let's see what this brings up. Somebody said $500 to $1,000. Somebody said $200. Somebody said $3,000. Somebody said millions. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Evil. Um, no, it's, it's actually about $150 to run that test. Um, a lipid panel at a typical hospital might be billed out at $120. Um, a complete blood count might be billed out at a hundred bucks. A, uh, 
hemoglobin A1C might be billed out at $120. So what I'm gonna show you next should shock you knowing those numbers that we can run a comprehensive metabolic panel for $6 for our patients. We can do a complete blood count for $4. We can do a lipid panel for $6. We can do a thyroid test for $6 and a hemoglobin A1C for $6. We run these tests on basically all of our patients if they're adults. It's about $30 to run all these tests at a hospital, at a hospital near you. This, these tests would probably cost $500 billed to you. Now your insurance may, might cover, if you're well insured and you let's say have an 80-20 plan, your insurance might cover 80% of that cost. So 80% of $500 is 400 bucks. So you're left with a bill of $100 and you might be thinking, oh, that's a great deal. I just, my insurance saved the day. I, I could have owed $500. Now I only owe $100. The sad reality is you owe $100 on $30 with the tests, right? The point I'm trying to make is that when you go to a hospital, the prices are inflated and people with insurance get a discount, but this really screws people over who are completely uninsured. Because if you're uninsured and you go to the hospital, they bill you for that full $500. And then it's your responsibility to pay that down and people go into debt and the number one reason for bankruptcy in the United States is medical debt, um, which is crazy. Okay. Um, so this holds for an, a long list of, of labs. You know, uh, I, I remember we ran an HIV test for one of my patients and um, they were scared to get tested because they didn't know how much it would cost. Unfortunately, they came out positive. They, I think they knew in the back of their mind that they might've been positive, but just like lowering the barrier of care to get somebody tested goes a long way. And then we were able to get this person enrolled into a patient assistance program through the Ryan White Foundation. And they were able to get onto um, antiretroviral medications to basically live a normal life for the rest of their lives um, if they can remain on these medications for long term. So, uh, like I said, you know, we're, we're saving people a lot of money on these labs. Rheumatoid factor, $8. I love that one. Uh, testosterone level of 30 bucks, FSH $8, LH is $8, $8 as well, vitamin D test 17 bucks, et cetera. One of the points I'm trying to make here um, is that you got to separate in your mind health insurance from health care. So health insurance is an umbrella. It's a protective device to protect you from going bankrupt. Great health insurance doesn't mean you'll get great health care. Health insurance is what you buy from the Bucas, Blue Cross, United, Cigna, Aetna, et cetera. Health care is what you get from a doctor who has the time to listen to you, care for you, and help you to navigate through our health care system. So I had a great interview with a local journalist in Detroit, and he sent me a list of meds. He was like, hey, asking for a friend. He was like, this is somebody's med list that I know. Um, what would it cost you at your clinic to fill these meds? And he gave me a list of, you know, Prilosec, that's, that's for acid reflux. You know, it's $17 at the pharmacy. It's 96 cents for a month supply at our office. Zocor, that's for cholesterol. $13 at the pharmacy, 57 cents at our office. Glucophage, that's metformin, that's for diabetes, type 2 diabetes. $13 at the pharmacy, 71 cents at our clinic. So, you know, if somebody's taking like four meds, I save them the cost of the membership on their meds alone. Plus they get one hour visits. Plus they can text me anytime they need to. Plus they can call me. Plus I can guarantee a same day or next day appointment, et cetera. That's the power of direct primary care. I'm saving people money. I'm making healthcare more affordable, more accessible and giving people great service. And that's really what this is all about. So these cost savings on meds, you know, hold across a, a wide range of things like flu shots, glipizide, pregnancy tests. We do pregnancy tests for free, even though they cost us about a dollar in the office. Uh, sildenafil for erectile dysfunction, simvastatin for high cholesterol, Bactrim for urinary tract infections. This is crazy. Somebody comes in with a UTI, we do urinalysis and urine culture for $10. We do a pregnancy test for, for free for them. And then we give them the Bactrim that they need, 84 cents 
to manage a urinary tract infection. Okay, so part of this is that, you know, we order the meds, we keep them in stock in the office and we can dispense them right from their office. This is such a cool thing for patients because they don't have to go to the pharmacy. They don't have to sit in those vinyl chairs, wait a couple hours for the pharmacist to sometimes get their meds right, sometimes mess up their meds. They don't have to get coughed on by somebody else waiting at the pharmacy, all that stuff. They just get it in a bag and we hand it to them and they're out the door and they're happy. So let's make this real. Um, I got another question for you guys. Do you guys know the cutoff point for Medicaid? Now it's different in every state, but do you know, you know, in Michigan, I'm thinking of a number, but does anybody know what the cutoff point for Medicaid? And what I mean by that is if you don't make any money, let's say you make $1,000 a year, you're qualified for Medicaid. But at some point, if you make too much money, you're disqualified from Medicaid meaning that you no longer get free healthcare from the state government or the federal government, subsidized by the federal government, but states often set their own rules on Medicaid cutoffs. Um, so, so for an individual, does anybody know what that number might be, that cutoff for Medicaid? Somebody said $2,000 a year, and that's, no, that's low. $35,000 a year, that's partially correct but that's too high. Somebody said $20,000 and that's pretty much right on the money. Here in Michigan, if you make more than $17,000 a year, you're disqualified from Medicaid, from Medicaid. So essentially, if you make about $10 an hour and you work 40 hours a week, you're disqualified from Medicaid. So if you have $20,000 a year in, in money that you bring in, can you afford private health insurance? And the answer is oftentimes no, because it's like $300 a month and if you're making $20,000 a year, you're making about $1,800 a month. And so maybe a quarter of your budget or a fifth of your budget would just go to health insurance. And for a lot of people, that's unsustainable. Like, let's say you, you make $1,800 a month. Maybe you spend $800 on rent, $400 on a car, $300 on groceries, and, and then that's about it. You know, so these are really tight margins for folks. That's the point I'm trying to make. So uh, our guy, Frank, he's 50. He's a truck driver. Ironically, he delivers medications for a pharmaceutical company, but they don't offer health insurance at his company. Um, companies with 50 or fewer full-time equivalents or full-time employees are not mandated to offer health insurance. The Affordable Care Act says that if you have 50 or more employees, everybody has to have insurance. But if you have fewer than 50, you're not mandated to provide insurance. So let's say there's 25 people in the company, they don't offer insurance. Um, so he makes too much, you know, at $15 an hour, he probably makes like 30,000, $34,000 a year. He makes too much to qualify for Medicaid, but not enough to buy private health insurance. He knows that he has diabetes. He knows that he has high blood pressure. He got this rip roaring infection on his hand. If you don't know, diabetics are susceptible to abscesses and infections because they have a lot of blood sugar and a key source of nutrients for bacteria is sugar. So if you have a lot of sugar in your blood, it makes it a really good environment for bacteria to grow. And so he got this terrible infection. He needed to have an IND also known as an incision and drainage. And then they gave him IV or intravenous antibiotics. So he hooked up an IV bag, put a uh, tube in his arm, and they slowly dripped antibiotics into his system. After a couple of days, he was ready to go home. The discharge nurse saw me on TV and said, you should see Dr. Thomas at Plum Health. So he signed up. This is a guy who hasn't been to a doctor in decades, like 20 years, because he knows that it's just too expensive. It's too expensive. He... Um, Every time he gets labs works, it was like 400 bucks for him. Every time he had his insulin filled, it was like $300. And every time he went in for a doctor's appointment, it was $200 for the visit because that's what the cash pay visit price was because he's uninsured, right? So if you had to do that every month, that would be about $700, $800 a month. And he's making what, like, I don't know, $3,000 a month. So it's a huge chunk of your budget to, to, to see health, get health care if you're uninsured. Anyway, so he came to our clinic. He pays $69 a month for the service. 
And then he pays uh, $2.70 every three months for his blood pressure medication, lisinopril, $4.32 every three months for his metoprolol, and $4.50 every three months for simvastatin. So that's about $12 every three months. So that's about $4 monthly for his meds. And we got him free Traceba and free Novolog or a long acting insulin in the Traceba and a short acting insulin in the Novolog to help him manage his diabetes for free because we work with Novo Nordis to get free samples. And any doctor in the United States can get free samples from Novo Nordis, their Novo MedLink or Novo Cares program. So we get a certain number of free samples every month. We hook it up for our diabetics who need it for free. We don't charge them any money. So for $69 a month in meds, $4 a month in, or sorry, $69 a month in the membership, $4 a month in meds. And then we do his lab work every three months to check his A1C. So let's say about $10 every month. Um, so for about like $70, $85 a month, we're managing this guy's diabetes and high blood pressure and high cholesterol, AKA metabolic syndrome. And so we take a guy who goes from ig totally ignoring his healthcare because it's scary and expensive to empowering somebody to take down their blood sugar every single morning. So if you don't know, diabetics are supposed to check their fasting blood sugar every morning and then mealtime blood sugar as well to calculate how much insulin to give themselves during meals. So you can see this guy is like, Okay, 150, that's pretty good. 139, that's great. 111, that's perfect, right? That's ideal. You should be between like 80 and 126 for your blood sugars, right? So you take a guy who's been willfully ignorant of his healthcare to empowered enough to bring in it like his rap sheet of his blood sugar readings. And that's a beautiful thing. I love talking about this. I get chills talking about it because this model empowers people, period. Okay, so in summary, family medicine, traditional family medicine offices uh, that bill insurance. There's about 133,000 family physicians practicing in that model. There's about 1,500 physicians practicing in the DPC model and growing. Usually you have to have 2,400 patients in your panel to be sustainable in fee-for-service medicine. In direct primary care, you need about 500. I have 450. I do fine. I feel great every day going into work. I see about five to 10 patients a day. Today, I saw 10 patients in the clinic and I felt really busy. Okay. I can't even imagine going back to seeing 25 patients a day. Um, how long is a visit? In the fee-for-service world, it's 13 to 16 minutes. In the direct primary care world, it's a half hour to a full hour. I can spend a full hour with my patients. Sometimes I do. I had a couple of patients today that I saw for a full hour. Talk about their depression their issues with coronavirus vaccines, all that stuff. Doctors get paid a salary, $200,000 a year. In DPC, you get paid with your membership. So if you want to charge people $80 a month, which is within your right, and you want to have 500 patients, that's $40,000 in revenue every month. And if you keep your overhead low, you could walk out with $30,000 a month in profit for yourself. That'd be $360,000 a year. So that's pretty cool, right? You can set your own prices if you know your value, if you're good at branding and marketing, if you're good at attracting patients, if you're a great physician. You're, if you're a great doctor, you should be able to charge more money for the, the care that you provide, right? So I think that's pretty cool. You can set your own prices. Can you use insurance and fee-for-service? Yes. In direct primary care, no. Now that is to say, we don't discriminate. We, we take folks who are fully insured. We take people who are uninsured. We take people who are underinsured. We take care of Medicare patients, Medicaid patients, uh, PPO plan patients, HMO plan patients, et cetera, and everybody in between. I say that because people find value in our service at different levels. We have CEOs of companies who their time is extremely valuable. And if they can call me and solve an issue in five minutes, that's, that's worth thousands of dollars to them and time save going to the doctor, waiting a few hours, being seen hours later, and then having to drive to and from. If I can just do a quick FaceTime and solve a problem for like a high power CEO, that, that's really invaluable. For other people on the lower income spectrum, lower end of the income spectrum, you know, the value is in that it's really inexpensive. 
right? So it works on different levels for different people. Um, the cost of the blood tests and cost of prescription meds are based on our wholesale prices. Um, where in the fee-for-service system, it's set by the hospital that you go to. Okay, um, I'll, I'll do this slide. I mean, I was talking to some accountants today about this. And one of the things I noted is that it's getting harder and harder to own and operate your own direct primary or your own practice. And in 2018, we hit that inflection point where more doctors are employed now than who own their own practice. And for me, that's a little bit frightening. I think more doctors should own their own practices. All right, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. Um, I'm, I'm happy to take any questions that you have about me or what I do, uh, and I'll answer anything you have. All right, sounds good, Dr. Thomas. Thank you so much, first of all, to begin with for that presentation. I personally oh, welcome. That. I'm sure that many of our audience members learned a lot too, um, particularly with something that goes outside of the reach of just um, the modern or the typical kind of specialty oriented questions like the day in the life. It's definitely interesting to see a new model of medicine. Uh, so we, our few, first question here is, what are the barriers preventing doctors from switching over to DPC as a system? And is it hard or expensive to get started? Okay, so those are great questions. First of all, I started my practice with about, I put in about $5,000. I wrote a grant, I got about seven, or actually I did a pitch competition and I won about $7,500. My mom was really happy for me and she gave me, um, actually my grandma was really happy for me and she gave me about $5,000 to, to get this started. And so I started really on a shoestring budget and I started in a one room office um, that was like 150 square feet. So like 10 feet by 16 feet, like 160 square feet essentially. So I started with a really low overhead. The barriers to getting started is like knowledge and business know-how. And I tell people like, if you're smart enough to get into medical school and pass your boards, and if you're gritty enough to get through residency and you're compassionate enough to choose a primary care specialty, you have all the ingredients that you need to be successful in direct primary care as a business person and in running your own business. These are not difficult skills. This is not renal pathophysiology, okay? This is like doing basic accounting, like running a QuickBooks, keeping track of your accounts receivable. Um, that's like the money coming into your practice and the things of accounts payable, the bills that you have to pay, right? So um, it's not complicated. People just need, doctors just need a little kickstart. I, I included a link in the chat of my book that I wrote specifically for this. I get, this is a question I get the most. How did you do this? How the hell did you, Paul Thomas, you know, regular average doctor um, with an average student loan debt come out of medical school, come out of residency and start your own practice five months later. And I wrote it all in my book and I put it all in that startup DPC book. The, in essence, I took two small business courses, each were eight weeks. I learned about branding and marketing. I learned about leveraging my social media platforms to get more patients. I learned about hiring a lawyer, hiring an accountant, building a team around me that could help me succeed. And I just went out there and did it. You know, it took me some time. I worked as a side hustle. I worked at an urgent care two days a week, a weekday and a weekend day. So I had some income coming in and I just let Plum Health grow organically, no pun intended, where I could just kind of have it low pressure, just let people come to it. I didn't come off desperate. I was just like, hey, this is my service. This is what I do. I'd love you to be a part of it. If not, that's cool too. I got a hundred people to sign up in the first year. By the end of two and a half years, I had 575 patients and I hired another doctor. And then we got up to like 800 patients between the two of us and we hired another doctor, right? And so that's how we built it. We're currently around 1,100 patients. I have about 450 patients. Dr. Orlick has about 400 and Dr. Rabo has about 250. You know, so that, that's kind of where we're at right now. Interesting, definitely interesting. The next question we have is, what is your day in the life like? Uh, what do you typically do? And to go along with that, what's your favorite part of primary care? Yeah, so my favorite part of primary care is helping people make changes in their lives for the better. Helping people lose weight or eat healthier or manage their diabetes or manage their high blood pressure or help them 
help their parents transition to a nursing home or help people, you know, and bring a new baby into the world. Those are the things that I love the most. I love taking care of newborns and kids and, you know, even older adults as they transition to like assisted living facilities and even to like palliative care situations. I love helping people understand their diagnoses and their bodies and their health. To go along with that, my day looks like I see probably five to 10 patients and I usually block out 30 minutes to an hour with each patient. At most, I'll spend about seven hours of my day seeing patients. Um, and that's on a really busy day. And I'll have at least an hour for lunch and admin time or meetings like this where I get to talk to enthusiastic medical students, pre-meds, doctors, et cetera. I love doing this stuff. Um, to go along with that, you know, some days I'll only see two patients or three patients. And those days feel like a home run because I'm texting some patients, I'm emailing some patients, a few patients come to the office, I write a blog post, I do a social media post, I do an interview with our local TV station about coronavirus vaccines, um, et cetera. I, I do all this kind of stuff. Or I, I work on a book, I'm writing my third book now. Um, I've written two books so far, published two books. I've written my third book and it's getting published right now. Um, I do things that I love to do. I love medicine. Um, but medicine isn't the end all be all. I want to do other things too. Like I, I have always wanted to be a published author. So I went out and did that. I kind of want to buy properties in Detroit and rehab them and make them beautiful again. Um, and, or like, you know, maybe buy a piece of land in Detroit and turn it into a healing garden or something like that. You know, I have kind of these big ideas that I want to pursue and by seeing, you know, a smaller amount of patient, it gives me more time to think about what actually makes me happy. And that that's kind of a cool place to be. That sounds great. Uh, just a quick question we have here is what are the names of your books? Uh, someone's interested in looking into them. Yeah, I'll leave a, a link to Amazon in the chat, but the first one is called direct primary care. If you just go uh, look on Amazon for direct primary care, you'll find it. Um, it's called direct primary care, the cure for our health, broken healthcare system. And then the other one is uh, Startup DPC, How to Start and Grow Your Direct Primary Care Practice. The first book is kind of light. It's like 12,000 12, words. Yeah, 12,000 words. And it's uh, pretty short. It takes about an hour to read it. The next book is like a monster. It's like 140,000 words. Uh, probably would take you like eight hours, 10 hours to read it. But it really gets into the nitty gritty of how to start and grow a practice. Yeah, definitely, uh, definitely seems informative. Before you chose family medicine and dived into primary care, were there other specialties that you were interested in joining? Yeah, I mean, I loved every rotation that I went through in medical school, which means I was going to be a good family doctor because you were kind of like the jack of all trades. So I loved, I actually loved surgery, but I didn't want to be a surgeon because of the lifestyle. I really loved ob gyn because it was like a really joyful thing to deliver babies. I loved peds because it was great taking care of kids. I also loved geriatrics and palliative medicine. I really liked um, uh, urology was a lot of fun. Dermatology was really cool. And so many great rotations in med school and in residency. And I think that's why I like it so much. And with that, I built some really cool relationships with specialists. So, you know, some people ask me like, well, how do you feel confident taking care of these, all these different things? Well, is it, when you get through your residency, you see a lot, but then for the things outside of your scope, you can always phone a friend. You can call, you can do a curbside consult with a specialist that you trust. You can refer them to that specialist if it's, they need a really full workup with them. Um, I use Rubicon, which is an e-consult platform. Um, I can text some, like, so like today I had somebody with a, um, a corneal abrasion. So we did a floor scene stain of their eye and, um, I texted one of my ophthalmology colleagues and was like, Hey, Justin, what's up, man? Help me out with this. And so he talked me through it. It was great. Uh, we just had a, like a three minute phone call. You know, uh, I was planning on giving him a floxacin. He recommended giving erythromycin as well. You know, those, those things help me hone my patient care. I, I referred that patient to see a specialist in person because a corneal, corneal abrasion is not something you want to mess with. So they got in that day at 1230 with one of my other colleagues who practices locally and they were able to see them and they agreed with my care plan, which was like a really cool thing to happen. 
in terms of when you chose family medicine, when did that point come across? Uh, probably in my third year, as I was getting to the end of my like core rotations, I was like, yeah, I'm pretty sure I'm going to be a family doc. Okay. Another student asks about work-life balance. So do you think having gone through the rotations and um, meeting other specialties, meeting other specialties, uh, do you think that it's better in direct primary care to have a better work-life balance? Well, I, I really believe that I have a better work-life balance because I'm able to um, spend, spend my time at my office taking care of my patients and not really doing that much like unnecessary administrative stuff. I'm able to see fewer patients. So I'm working fewer hours and it affords me. To, and because like I own my own practice, I can set my like vacation time and really flexibly. And I only have two other partners. So their vacation time is super flexible as well. Um, so all those things help to, to give like a good quality of life. You know, this is, this is really unusual. I usually don't do things like this in the evening because I usually after like six o'clock, it's just, I spend time with my family, but you, I'm making an exception for you guys. Cause you're like pre-meds and med students. So, um, I, I included my Instagram. If you guys want to follow me on Instagram, that'd be tremendous. Um, you know, little things like following me on Instagram or on Twitter or on LinkedIn go a long way. I'll put it on my LinkedIn. And if you just like my posts or share my posts, it really goes a long way to getting the word out. You know, I, I do these kind of things for free, but you know, little things like picking up the book or leaving a review or um, following me on Instagram, liking a post or sharing a post, all that goes a long way because you know, it helps me get the word about out about this model, it helps us attract new patients. And it ultimately helps improve our healthcare system as more and more doctors know that this option exists for them. Definitely. Um, about the pharmacists that you keep regular contact with, in general, do most of these practices uh, have pharmacists on call or within close reach to prevent drug interactions and ensure health of patients in that particular way? Yeah, so that's a great question. I do have a, a pharmacist that I keep in touch with from residency. He's great. He's He has me call him anytime I need to. So if I have any questions, but you know, in your residency, you do get really good training on drugs, medications, interactions. So you should be pretty confident. And if you're not, that's when you should be referring to a specialist. Um, there's also a drug interaction checker. If you have Medscape, um, you can go on to Medscape and search for their drug interaction checker. So if I'm unsure, I can always go into that Medscape tool and check there as well. And you discussed a bit about the process of starting up your practice. Were there any other challenges that you haven't mentioned so far that you did face while opening up your own clinic? And how did you overcome those challenges? Yeah, so, you know, when you start your own business, it can be a lonely journey. It's, it can be tough to you know, do everything. And so one of the things that helped me was networking with other doctors who were in a similar path in their journey. So like other DPC doctors. So I attended the national conference for direct primary care physicians through the American Academy of Family Physicians. And so I got to meet other great doctors who are doing this in their communities and learn from them and share best practices. And so that was helpful. The other thing that helped was just like joining young professional organizations here in Detroit and networking with other professionals. I, I met a great accountant, I met a great lawyer. I made friends with other professionals who are in you know, event design or you know, just other industries. And I learned a lot from them and their successes. So you know, making friends with other small business owners, other like self-starters helps to make the journey a little bit less lonely and more enjoyable as you all succeed together. And you have already kind of gone through how um, how the decision to turn to direct primary care or DPC is almost a no-brainer for patients, but in the beginning, how did you market this or attract patients to um, join your clinic? Yeah, so I used my social media accounts was a big part of it, and then the other thing that I used uh, was search engine optimization. So if you go to my website, plumhealthdpc.com, you can navigate over to our blog, and I often blog about regular topics like smoking cessation in Detroit or primary care doctor accepting new patients in Detroit. And so if you're Googling, I want to quit smoking in Detroit, you might find our blog post and then you might learn more about our practice. And if it's a fit for you, you'll sign up. Or if you're Googling, 
uh, primary care doctor accepting new patients, Detroit or near me, and you're doing that in Detroit, you'll find our practice and we'll show up as like the number one hit on Google. So that's called search engine optimization. I really did that a lot. I made a ton of YouTube videos. I've done a lot of things like this where I reach out to other doctors, other medical students, other residents, and they actually refer me patients as well. Sounds good. And this is um, a common question we often have when we have physicians that do come on. So what is the advice that you give to the aspiring doctors and just in general healthcare professionals listening in? Oh, man. Um, you know, one thing I read that was really profound when I started my practice was uh, Cheryl Sandberg's book, um, Lean In, right? And so it's about leadership. And one thing that she says is like the posters at Facebook, done is better than perfect. And a lot of times doctors get wrapped up in being perfect. You know, oftentimes in the culture of medicine, mistakes are punished at, or frowned upon. You know, mistakes are punished at worst and frowned upon at best. And you're you know, given a stern talking to if you mess something up. In business, uh, mistakes are more or less celebrated because it's a failure point. It's an opportunity to, to learn and to grow. Like Thomas Edison, I'm paraphrasing here. It's like he's made a thousand mistakes, but he's a thousand steps closer to finding the right answer, right? So in like creating the light bulb or something like that. Um, so I think we need to change the culture of medicine to, to celebrate um, mistakes and, and learning from mistakes. I think we're doing better with that, you know, with like more like um, grand rounds, being more open about mistakes and things like that. But too often we sweep those mistakes under the rug and we don't learn from them. Um, and then the other thing is like, we need to embrace business. Doctors need to embrace the business aspect of medicine because if we leave it to MBAs, we're gonna get what we got right now, which is a broken healthcare system. We need doctors to stand up and feel empowered and become empowered to lead in medicine with compassion, with the rights and privileges of physicians and the rights and privileges of patients close to heart to right our healthcare system. And I'm gonna leave you guys with that because it's nine o'clock and I, I gotta go hang with the family. Uh, thanks so much for your time tonight. And thanks for having me as a part of this. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Dr. Thomas. It's been a lot of great insight about the bigger picture in healthcare, and I'm sure we all can appreciate that. So I think that wraps up today's session. Again, thank you, Dr. Thomas, for joining in and taking time out of your busy schedule uh, to come on. So for our audience to receive a certificate for the session, you must pass the quiz on our website, which is now uploaded. And be sure to join us for our next virtual shadowing session with Dr. Block on October 27th at 7 p.m. Central. Thank you, Dr. Thomas, once again, and have a good night, everyone. You're welcome. Thanks again for having me on and good luck everyone in your studies. Thank you, Dr. Thomas. All right. See ya.